President Thomas Jefferson said, I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. Welcome to the intersection of faith and politics. Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. That young man is right. If we're going to correct those abuses of the Constitution, we've got to learn more about it. Well, one of the things we do here on Wall Builders Live is look at things that are happening in the news and in the culture from both a biblical and a historical point of view, but also a constitutional point of view. That's a big part of that historical point of view if we're going to get it right, if we're going to look at these things correctly and preserve that freedom for future generations. So looking forward to Thursday zeroing in on some of those issues in the news, David, that deal with those constitutional issues and a little bit more of a of a, uh, of a focus on the Constitution. And, of course, the Second Amendment. That's a big part of the Constitution that has been uh, debated quite a bit in recent years and certainly in uh, in recent weeks and it's something that gets regulated at both the state and the federal level and i had the chance to do a uh, my constitution class in independence hall on the very spot where the constitution was was framed and one of my boys reagan actually taught on the second amendment so we're going to start today with a clip from reagan teaching on the second amendment at independence hall in philadelphia pennsylvania richard henry lee was the founding father in the continental congress who made the motion for America's independence on June 7, 1776. Lee once said, To preserve liberty, it is essential that the whole body of all people possess arms and be taught how to use them, especially when young. This might explain why John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, was out with the Massachusetts Minutemen doing musket drills when he was only eight years old. The founding father said, that the Second Amendment is the one that protects all our other freedoms. It says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. At that time, the militia was every man that could fire a rifle. So this freedom wasn't for the official military, it was for we the people, which is why it says, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Even if you don't like hunting or guns as much as our family, you would be wise to help protect the rights of other families like ours so we can keep our guns. Just in case someday we need to use those guns to help protect your rights. Well, there you go, David. Second Amendment, obviously an individual right to keep and bear arms, but man, there have been an awful lot of efforts, sometimes very successful at the state level as well, to infringe on that right and keep people from being able to protect themselves and their family. There is a lot going on. We've seen even with the Sandy Hook massacre, now the Second Amendment is under direct assault. But people say, well, no, no, wait, wait, you don't need the Second Amendment. I mean, that's for hunting and that's for sporting, and we're not going to take that away from you. And people get the wrong impression of that. As a matter of fact, in the last election, three of the 176 initiatives that happened across the states dealt with the right of state constitutions to include specific language that guarantees the right to hunt and fish. So hunting and fishing, that's a part of the Second Amendment, but that's not the essence of it. The essence of it is self-defense. You go back to the Declaration. The Declaration is real clear that, one, there is a creator. Two, the creator gives certain guaranteed rights to men. And three that government exists primarily to protect those guaranteed God-given inalienable rights. Well, one of the inalienable rights is the right to defend yourself. Founders call that the biblical right of self-defense, and that is the Second Amendment. Second Amendment is not about hunting or fishing. Now, uh, the founders did argue that, that you had a right to feed yourself, and that's a God-given right to provide for your family and feed yourself, which includes being able to hunt and fish and, and get game, particularly at that time. So that's part of the Second Amendment, but it's primarily for self-defense. And if these well, it must have drove you just as crazy as me. Then all throughout the Clinton years, Clinton and Gore would run around saying, uh, for their gun control measures, "Don't worry, Bubba, we're not going to take away your shotgun." And, I, and I'd say, "Wait a minute, the Second Amendment doesn't have anything to do with pheasants. It has everything to do with freedom." Not this. It, you're right. It's not it's about not, and, and the other thing protection. you need to remember that is the Second Amendment is not to arm you less than it's to arm the government. Because what specifically happened was if the Americans had not been able to go home and grab their their guns off the mantle over the fireplace, they could not have taken on the British coming after them. The British was their government. 
and the the Americans had to have equal firepower with whoever was coming after them, and that's why they went to Fort Ticonderoga and got all the British cannons, came back and used those. That was just individual citizens doing that. So the the, the purpose of the Second Amendment was you've got to be able to defend yourself, your rights, period, against anybody, and that sometimes mean it may be your government coming after you. So if the government's got AR-15s, guess what? The people can have AR-15s. Well, you know, you, you don't need, wait a minute, whatever the government's got, you got to be able to defend yourself against. So there was no limitation on what you could or couldn't do with the Second Amendment. It was a self-defense amendment. And if everybody else is coming at you with AR-15s, you don't defend yourself with a BB gun, you get AR-15s. So that that was the understanding was it is a biblical right of self-defense and you have the right to respond back in kind to whoever's coming after you to take away your right to defend yourself. Well, isn't it interesting that if you're going to be able to defend yourself, then that carries, uh, you know, on its face the ability to be able to have that gun with you and to be able to carry it. And, And so you've had a lot of states pass concealed carry laws and open carry laws where people can actually protect themselves when they're out there on the street or they're in their car or they're in a store or wherever they go. But some states, man, they have they've done everything they could to prevent that from happening. Illinois being the worst of all, not allowing any kind of a concealed carry at all. And David, you know how we often are shocked here on the program when we talk about the courts actually being good news and the courts getting it right. Actually, Illinois just had their ban on concealed carry struck down by the courts. Which is not surprising, but that does mean we actually have some judges who read the Constitution, and that's a great thing. And this has really been interesting because in the last two or three years, the, we've had a couple of Supreme Court decisions and a whole bunch of lower court decisions. And this is one where the courts have gotten it right from top to bottom, is that, wait a minute, This is an individual right, and the militia is not the military. We, the people, are the militia. Every able-bodied person who who could bear arms is part of the militia. So you had the Continental Army that George Washington ran, but you also had the state militias, and that was just the people banding themselves together. And so you have individual rights, you have collective rights, but it all goes back to self-defense. But to to see the courts get it right, and particularly— Um, where you're going to have the argument of gun control by the other side. Well, this is for safety. This is to to make sure the people are safe. We're taking guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't. Courts aren't buying that because this is an individual God-given inalienable right. And again, what makes America unique, those first 155 words in the Declaration start with the three premises. There is a God. The God God gives us rights, and government exists primarily to protect our God-given rights. And so it really is cool to see the federal courts saying, yep, that third part, government's supposed to protect your right to keep and bear arms, and we're going to do that. Well, that God-given right uh, finally being returned to the people of Illinois. There's a state rep there that's been trying for years to get concealed carry passed so that citizens could defend themselves and their families. And he's going to be with us when we come back from the break, Representative Brandon Phelps of Illinois, when we come back on Wobblers Live. Abraham Lincoln said, We the people are the rightful masters of both Congress and the courts. Not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who pervert the Constitution. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Often today, it seems that the federal government has become too intrusive into local matters and federal micromanagement has now unfortunately become the norm in education, law enforcement, religious expressions, and even on what is and is not moral. Strikingly, the Founding Fathers had intended that the federal government never intrude into any of these issues. As Thomas Jefferson explained, taking from the states the moral rule of their citizens and subordinating it to the federal government would break up the foundations of the Union. I believe the states can best govern our home concerns and the federal government our foreign ones. According to Thomas Jefferson, the original plan was for the federal government to direct foreign affairs, but for the states and local communities to direct the domestic and the moral ones. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Thomas Jefferson said, The Constitution of most of our states, and of the United States, 
assert that all power is inherent in the people, that they may exercise it by themselves, that it is their right and duty to be at all times armed, that they are entitled to freedom of person, freedom of religion, freedom of property, and freedom of press. Welcome back to the intersection of faith and politics. Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. Thanks for staying with us. Our guest today from the great state of Illinois is State Rep. Brandon Phelps. Thanks for coming on, Representative. Hey, thanks for having me on. Hey, big, uh, big victory for you guys at the court level. Uh, the court has uh, struck down the ban on concealed carry of a handgun uh, there in Illinois. What happens next? I know you've been involved in this fight for a while. In fact, you carried legislation uh, last year. Uh, to try to get a concealed carry in that state. Right, guys. I've uh, sponsored this bill for 10 years now, being a state rep. And, uh, you know, we've always battled Cook County and Chicago. But finally, the uh, Federal Court of Appeals in the Seventh Circuit said that Illinois' ban on concealed carry is unconstitutional and that it mandates the state of Illinois to come up with a law within 180 days. So you guys had a, had a total ban, right? I mean, there was no way to get a concealed carry license in, in Illinois. We were the only state that did, did not have any permit process whatsoever. But yes, we were the only state, and, uh, you know, Wisconsin was one of the last two. They got theirs, and we were the only one, that, and it was all to do with Cook County and Chicago. Wow. So what what happens next? Uh, the, the court says you know, unconstitutional to not have some way to exercise your Second Amendment right and, and be able to protect yourself and your family. D- does it get kicked back to you guys in the legislature, and you come up with a way to do that? Well, here, here's the thing. Yes, it, I think that you'll see different versions being filed on uh, what people think, different legislators around the state think what the, uh, the uh, concealed carry bill should be. House Bill 148 that I had last year was, was very restrictive. Now, uh, we probably won't run that bill because the court said we really don't have to have anything in restriction. But if we don't pass something with 180 days, constitutional carry sets in, and if you have a valid Void card in Illinois, you can open carry if you want. I mean, there will be no laws on the books. So I would think there's people in Chicago have something going here. I, I now my, my, I lost you for one second there on the a valid what what card? It's a Illinois is the only state that has a firearm owner identification card. F O I D. Ah, okay. And to purchase gun and ammunition in Illinois, you have to have that for your card. It, it's uh, you, you register for it. Uh, the state police does X, things like that. So that's what we're the only state that has it. I don't like it, uh, but uh, we, you know, it's been that way in Illinois for a long time. Yeah. So if you if you have to have that to to purchase, um, if if constitutional carry actually kicked in. Would you actually have to have one of those to carry, you think, or, or could you carry, you just wouldn't be able to purchase? I mean, if you purchased in another state or you moved there and had one, I guess I'm getting kind of on a rabbit trail here, but I was excited when you said you could get constitutional carry if nothing passed. I'm thinking about lobbying against your bill. No, I'm kidding, man. Yeah, no, <laughs> I know. Well, like I said, I don't know if some of the pro-gun groups really want to have a bill, Rick, to be honest yeah. with you, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of law-abiding gun owners that have Ford cards, of uh, course. So uh, if you have a valid Ford card in Illinois, you're going to be able to carry anything you want. I think you could even put a rifle on your shoulder and walk down Michigan Avenue in Chicago if you wanted. Wow. So so no question then I would think that the, the gun control folks are going to try to head that off at the pass. So they're going to come with some, some restrictions. I assume your guys, uh, you guys are, are, are teaming up to uh, to combat that and, and get a good concealed carry passed or nothing passed. Absolutely. And, uh, and Rick, I tell you what, I always believe in working in a uh, bipartisan manner, uh, manner. And uh, right now the downstate Dems and the downstate Republicans are working together. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of nice to see that. Well, what do you think is uh, – what's the target, I guess, or is it too soon to tell? I mean, what are you going to shoot for? Uh, is there a particular state that, that you want to model the, the way that they have their concealed carry? Well, we want we, – we don't want to be a may-issue state. We want to be a shall-issue state. I don't think it's right for state police in these other states like New York, Hawaii, and California that have may-issue because they more or less get to pick and choose who gets a concealed carry weapon or not. Uh, so I want it to be a shell issue. I do want there to be some strong background checks and uh, things of that matter, what happened in Connecticut. But, uh, hey, you know, it's a big victory here in Illinois, and we're going to take it, and uh, we're, we're going to get something done finally. No, it's great. It's great news, uh, and I love the way you're thinking, uh, uh, and, you know, that it, it wouldn't be a, a May situation where they might uh, issue the, the permit. If you meet the requirements, it ought to be a it ought to be a shout. Man, I had not even thought about the possibility of, uh, of constitutional carry if, if, if nothing passed. It, it just the, uh, the court decision would, would, would kick in. 
Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Do you know off the top of your head if there are any states that actually have constitutional carry, or does everybody have some sort of statutory carry on on the on the books? The way I was understanding, the way I was told, is that uh, every state has something on the books uh, yeah. can be dealing with open carry or concealed carry. And like I said, Illinois, we're the only state. It's a shame that it took a court case yeah. to finally get Second Amendment rights back to the law abiding gun owner. But we're very glad it was to happen here in Illinois. Well, I, I know you can't, you you couldn't say it or admit it on the air, but you have to snicker a little bit at all those guys that killed your bills in the in the past because now they're going to get the worst case in their view, best case in our view, but worst case in their view because they weren't willing to pass something reasonable you were trying to get done over the last ten years. Well, I mean, look, Rick, I, I'll tell you, I said this openly on the floor last year. I said sooner or later, all you that voted no on House Bill 148, the concealed carry bill in Illinois. You're going to, there's going to be a time, time of day where the courts are going to rule in our favor, and you're going to wish you had voted for House Bill 148. And just the other day, after that court case, I had 10 different legislators that voted against that bill last year. They said, Brandon, if you call House Bill 148 right now, we're going to vote for it tonight. <laughs> How about that, man? How about that? Well, hey, God bless you, bro. Excited for you and, and the other folks in Illinois and for everybody to get their constitutional rights to to be able to protect themselves and their families and just really interested in how this is going to play out. So hopefully we can have you back in a few months and give us an update. Rick, I, I would love to. I really appreciate you thinking of me, and, and I and I agree with you. I don't think there's anything wrong with you defending yourself and your family. Amen to that. Representative Brandon F- F- Phelps, thank you, sir. Keep up the good work up there in Illinois. Thank you, sir. You bet. Back in a moment with David Barton. People all over America are concerned about the course and culture of our nation. We know in our hearts that the number one priority should be a return to biblical foundations. We we know in our heads that we should also be returning to history. And I'm holding in my hands what may be the most powerful tool I've ever seen for doing both of those things. A biblical foundation and the history of our nation is found in the Founder's Bible. It's an amazing new publication, I think probably the most important publication that Wall Builders has ever been a part of. It actually gives you a chance to go back to the history of America in the Bible, to be able to trace back where the founders got the ideas for creating the most successful nation in history. It's a gorgeous work. It's 2,208 two-color biblical pages as well as a ton of full-color inserts, over 330 pages and 40 major articles from David Barton and others teaching us about that history, telling the story of the founders, and at the same time being able to reference those biblical foundations. It's absolutely the perfect gift at this time in our nation's history when we so need these biblical foundations. Check it out at wallbuilders.com. It's called The Founder's Bible. Thomas Jefferson said, In questions of power, then let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. If we're going to bind down with the chains of the Constitution, we got to know what those principles are from the Constitution. Second Amendment, a big one, David. And I, I'm excited, man. I mean, Illinois, Illinois is going to get it right. I mean, they could actually end up well, with a it, constitutional it, it, carry. Illinois could have actually the most open guns of any state in the nation because it may go to constitution carry if they don't pass anything at all. And wouldn't that, that be great? That would be, you know, wouldn't that, what a crazy thing that Illinois goes from the most regulated state to the most unregulated state. And, and what does that mean? Constitution, they're simply going back to the Constitution. Wouldn't that be a weird thing that that by default, Illinois goes back to the Constitution, which means there's more gun freedom in Illinois than any other state? That would be so wild. You know, President Obama may not even want to visit his home state anymore because <laughs> yeah, it'll right. resemble too much of the original Constitution. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought his home state was Hawaii. No, we're not going there. All right. We're, we're not doing <laughs> I that. I thought it was Kenya. Wait. No, no. Let's not go there. You're right. You're, you're right. We're, we're not going there. But, you know, I, I was shocked to, to hear Brandon say, that you can't even buy ammo in Illinois. That 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 FOID, the firearms owner identification card. What business is it of government whether I buy a box of twenty two shells or not? I mean, yeah. That that to me that that infringes just as badly as them not issuing. And I thought he made a great point in, in the way that he was talking about the difference in a May issue and a shell issue state. 
uh, where that a may issue says, well, the, the, the state may issue a license if it wants to, as opposed to a shall issue state where the, sh- the state shall issue a license to applicants who, who apply for concealed carry, et cetera. And that is yeah, a I big distinction. I mean, it's a little bitty word, but it's a big difference in the way it works out in pol- policy. Man, you, you're so right. And I was totally unaware of that. I, I was actually going through renewal for concealed carry here in Texas, and the, and the instructor was t- telling us about that. And he said that in some states like California, where it's a May issue state, you have to get the permission of the chief law enforcement officer, typically the sheriff in that county, and that there's some counties that issue one license. In fact, I think he said it was either Barbara Boxer or, or I think it was Boxer would brag about she was the only one in the county where she lived that had that license. So it's a total elitist attitude. If you didn't have the connection to the sheriff, you don't get it. So Brandon's right, man. Let's uh, you know, let's really push for making sure these states have shall issue. So if you meet the, you know, if you take the class and you pass the proficiency test and you do all that. You, uh, you have to be given your license. And, and uh, I mean, we got to keep going back to the Constitution on this because this is a God-given right. It is not a government-given right. It's not a constitutionally granted right. It's a constitutionally secured right. Constitution right. didn't grant this. Constitution secured it. And, and, and by the way, i, I got to do a little, little side story here because people are always saying, hey, the First Amendment, religious expression, that's number one on the founders' list. That means it's the most important. No, that's not true. The Founders' List of the Bill of Rights had 12 amendments, and the first two did not get ratified initially. One got ratified later. So the First Amendment was actually the Third Amendment. The Second Amendment was actually the Fourth Amendment. That's but they right. Weren't, they, they weren't ranking these things by saying what's most important. They're saying every one of these is a God-given right, and every one's got to be protected. So it doesn't matter what's first and what's sixth. I mean, the, the Sixth Amendment, the right to legal confrontation, that's as much a God-given right out of John chapter 5 as is self-defense in the Second Amendment out of Exodus chapter 22, as is First Amendment right of religious conscience out of First Corinthians 8. I mean, they're, they're all God-given rights. So don't ever get in the thing of thinking that, well, it's a Second Amendment, so it's really high on the list, really important. No, it's important because it's a God-given right that the Constitution secures and the government has to protect. And so that's the way you have to approach every one of these amendments, including this one. And so when you look at whether it's a may issue or a shell issue state, hey, it's got to be a shell issue because it's a God-given right. I have the right to keep and bear arms. I have the right to defend myself. I have a right to own a gun and, and have ammunition. And so government can't say may. It has to say shall. And that needs to be the mentality we look at every one of these policies with. This is a God-given right. Now, I may not want to exercise it. But if I do want to exercise it, the government can't tell me, no, you don't have the right to, to own guns or defend yourself or anything else. And, and that's the way we have to think about it individually as citizens. Well, David, I'm holding in my hands one of the best books you ever put out. It's on the Second Amendment. It's a little great primer on the, on the Second Amendment, folks. If you don't have it, you need to get it. And, and you say in here, you, you do a whole chapter on the, exactly what you just said, that it's a God-given right. You quote guys like John Dickinson, who was a Constitution signer, who defined inalienable rights as a right God gave to you, and no inferior power has a right to take away. So Chicago and Illinois, an inferior power from God, does not have the right uh, to take away that individual right. And you also explain, uh, in James Wilson's words, he said that it didn't create new rights, but it rather secured old rights. So like you're saying, these are rights God gave us a long time ago from the very beginning, and the document is just simply you know, mapping those out and saying, hey, let's not forget that this is something that God gave to the people, and government better not take it away. And one of the things the founders were also very strong on with, was, is with every right, there's a corresponding responsibility. And so anytime you, if you have the right of free speech, you have a responsibility to tell the truth when you exercise free speech. If you have the right to keep and bear arms, you have a responsibility not to kill innocent people. So one of the things that, that I encourage with everybody is know your rights and use your rights. But by the way, if you got kids, train your kids in these rights. If you're not familiar with guns, man, go to a gun safety class and learn how to use it. Go to a gun shop, go to a gun range and, and, and shoot it till you're really comfortable with it. And at that time, you're no longer scared of your rights. You may never exercise them, and God willing, you'll never have to, but you'll have those rights. And so, I mean, I really encourage folks to get their kids in, in gun safety classes really early. Uh, I, I've talked before about how we got our kids started at the age of four, and I'm sure you did your, your kids too. You want them to get the right thinking from the very, very early stages. So there is a right to keep and bear arms, but there's a responsibility to be safe when we do so, to be wise when we do so, to know how to use the arms that we own. And that's whether it's an AR-15 or whether it's a, a single-shot BB gun. It, it doesn't matter. 
We need to be familiar with that. So that's our responsibility. This is a God-given yes. right. We need to defend that right, not only for ourselves, but for everyone else. If you don't own a gun, great. You stand up and defend the right for everybody else to own a gun. But you also need to know the responsibilities that go with that, and that's a good thing for everyone to learn. No doubt about it, man. Earlier this week, uh, we did a program, and uh, you played. Uh, we played some some clips, and we played that one clip of the lady that defended her her nine year old twins and herself with a revolver when that intruder came in the house. They hid in the crawl space, and when he found them, she had no choice. She took she she shot the guy and saved her kids' lives and her her life. Uh, I would say to the husbands out there, man, if if you weren't at home and that and, and that was happening to your wife, you'd be glad that you and her had gone out and gotten trained on That's how right. to shoot a gun. So make sure that you're getting your family prepared to defend and protect themselves. It's part of our responsibility, just as David said. Be sure and pick up that book at wallbuilders.com on the Second Amendment. It's just a quick read, but it'll equip you on this issue, and you'll really understand the constitutional foundation of your right to protect your family. Thanks for listening today to Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. President Calvin Coolidge said, The more I study the Constitution, the more I realize that no other document devised by the hand of man has brought so much progress and happiness to humanity. To live under the American Constitution is the greatest political privilege that was ever accorded to the human race.